All right, let's see here. Corn. All right. Everybody doing all right? Ready for a weekend? <laughs> I am so ready for the weekend. <laughs> of course, I've got a bunch to do yet today. So I'm trying to finish this paper, and it's really, I've probably put like, I don't know, earlier I said 50 hours into it. I think it's something like that. It's crazy. <laughs> so anyway, I feel like a grad student again. But. <laughs> Uh, let's pray. Dear Father, thanks for uh, your love for us, God, and just thanks that we can, again, just uh, rest in you and take a moment just to invite your presence here amongst us and just for us to sort of fix our thoughts and our minds on you and before we begin to talk about this stuff. And um, so just help us as we uh, do philosophical work, God. I pray that you would help us to be led to truth and help us to um, see this as a value, but only insofar as it really leads us to you um, as, uh, as, as Christian philosophers, help us to be Christian philosophers and not just philosophers. So um, we, we're convinced that you exist and that you uh, hold it all into being, and, and so therefore all of our projects and things uh, that we uh, come upon really do point uh, us to you. And so we're thankful for that. Pray that that would be our outlook. And so help us now. Help us to have a good class. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, so we ended last time um, talking about, uh, again, this sort of basic epistemological worry where, and, I, and again, I'm just going to have to say that this is not the best way to put it, <laughs> the best way to sketch it. Um, I forgot my marker today. Um, but there seems to be, it's sometimes called the veil, the veil of perception, that there's a way in which when it comes to our knowledge of, of objects in the world, there's, it's sort of veiled, in a sense, behind our, our perceptions of those things, right? So we have the visual experience that, um, again, we can, I, I think this is, I think to some degree this is plausible. I think this is, in, in fact, not just plausible, but to some degree, you know, undeniable that we have before us experiences of things that in some way mediate our access to them, right? Now again, I'm, there's gonna be different ways we can lay out a sort of case, and that's why I don't even like drawing it this way, but if this is the little visual experience of a tree, you know, coming from my mind or <laughs> whatever it is, uh, and then there's an actual tree out here, so we think, um, something like that's going on, right? But again, I just want to caution you that this really is not the right way to sketch it. it it's just a teaching tool for us now. Um, I'm going to push back hard on this sort of view, okay? But just take mental note of that, and we'll get to it later. But um, this, but there is there is something like that, right? There there is a way in which our perception mediates the objects of the world. And we can kind of show that as, a, again, almost an undeniable fact. Um, so when we start to think about what properties this tree has, right, what properties does it really have? Over and above, and, and tune in, the experience of the tree, <laughs> right? Because let's say it's got green leaves, that's what we're seeing. Is it really green? Well, we can, if you're colorblind, it's not green to you, right? That what it seems like we're doing in that case, like let's say you, I don't know what, I think colorblind usually goes to like grays and stuff, but um, uh, anybody colorblind in the room, by the way? Are you, like badly or is it just somewhat mildly? Okay. Um, is it gray, is that, am I right about that or is it? It's more confusion of colors than actual color. Okay, okay. 
so and that's why I, I, that's why I kind of pull back a little bit because even if people that are actually colorblind, it's it's some other thing. We can imagine somebody having whatever perceptual faculty you know differences than what typical humans have, where when they look at the leaves of a tree, they see red. Right now they're looking at the same tree as you and me, but we see green. Um, and when you start to sort of pull out what are the what are the properties of which we're aware that the tree actually has this guy, not this guy. What are we left with? <laughs> right, that's kind of the worry is that maybe none, because again, um, we can imagine ourselves being having a hallucination as of a tree. And in that case, we've got all the same properties of which we're aware. But there, I think we're going to say, like, when there is nothing out here, we're just having some bad, you know, delusional problem of sorts. Sorry, this marker's not <laughs> showing up very well either. Um, now there's nothing out here. It's just whatever the, the sort of causal story that we would tell of, of what's giving rise to the experience is some sort of delusion or brain damage or something like that. Um, all the properties had in this case would be just like the properties had when we're actually seeing a tree, which seems to suggest the properties are had here and not had here, or they're exemplified here and not exemplified here. So if that's right, then this can kind of drop out of the picture <laughs> in an epistemological sense, right? As really not figuring in, this figures in. But that's going to lead us to this big worry. And it's a worry about skepticism. And it's one of the primary topics um, in epistemology. And here, here's the thing that you always want to... Uh, be careful of when you hear the word skepticism. I think that was from last time. Yeah, thanks. Um, it's sort of like, what's my, I have an example of this. What's the right example? I can't remember my example. But, okay, so forget it's sort of like. Uh, what it is, is there's always a skepticism about something, some domain, right? Nobody's, I mean, you could be what's sometimes called a global skeptic. And that is to say, there is no knowledge whatsoever. But always the problem with that, what's the problem with that? Self it looks self-refuting, right? It, it's, it looks like the one thing that they seem to know is that global skepticism is true. But if they know that that's true, then it's, you know, then there is something that they know and they're not global skeptics. So, could you take that further and say that they're not skeptical that the language they're using, the words they're using, actually convey true ideas to the other people that they're talking to? Where the idea primarily is that's global yeah, that skeptics. Yeah. language truly does yeah. convey. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think so. And there's probably more that they're assuming. So, when the skeptic gives his or her arguments against knowledge, they seem to be assuming arguments and logic and some premises and things like that. And so it's very hard to be a global skeptic. Almost nobody in the history of philosophy has been a global skeptic. Some people have, you know, sort of claimed it or, or acted like it, but they really are not. More often than not, um, the respect in which somebody is a skeptic is they are a skeptic, uh, as, as it said, about the external world. So on this sort of picture, again, they're not necessarily saying this the external world doesn't exist. They're saying we don't have access to it, we don't have knowledge of it, um, and they're skeptics. They don't, they don't know. They can't rule out the possibility that they're in the matrix. They can't rule out the possibility that they're being halluc you know, hallucinating in these radical ways or the brain in a vat or evil demon if we're using Descartes example it has to be a skeptic skepticism about the external world it's being a skeptic about what's out here okay
But we also ended on saying there's one perhaps sort of glimmer of hope here uh, so far because it's a little, you know, worrisome perhaps. I mean, not really, but, you know, in an epistemic sense, perhaps. And that is that we at least do have this, though. Right? We do seem to be, we do seem to be, and this is something we talk about with Descartes, we seem to be beings, I think undeniably we're beings that have conscious awareness of some facts. Now again, we might not be of the view that we have conscious awareness of the facts out here, and that's the worry of skepticism about the external world. But again, we can't, even in our perceptions, we're not, we're not without any facts whatsoever. At least this, at least I seem to be aware of and know that I'm having a tree-like experience. Maybe that's a little too, you know, to call it a tree-like experience might assume some things there. Um, Tim McGrew um, will say, what we minimally know is I'm experiencing this, <laughs> where the this just sort of points at the content of our experience. And so you, you say, well, what's the this? Well, whatever it's pointing at. So it's necessarily true that I'm experiencing this whenever I'm having an experience of any sort or other, because it really is just a pointing at what it, whatever it is. So, so that's, that's okay. You know, so we're at least, um, we at least have that. Um, so we know, you know, so if we're in pain, we can know that we're in pain because that's on this side of the veil, so to speak. When we have various sorts of experiences, you know, mentally, um, we can know that we have the beliefs that we have, usually, right? There might be some beliefs of the sort of Freudian sense, uh, you know, I don't really know what I'm talking about here, but uh, that are like kind of down underneath that we don't really know that we do. Maybe we're really in love with our mothers, I don't, you know, whatever, whatever is supposed to be the Oedipus complex, um, right? Um, again, I don't, I don't subscribe to all that, but maybe we have this, you know, belief that we're going to be rejected by the male figures in our life. You know, some sort of belief like that that's way down deep. Maybe we don't have a, uh, an awareness of that, but that I believe God exists. Of course I have awareness of that, right? That's, that's this sort of obviously part of my conscious experience, if I can use the word experience there. Um, you know, and, and all my other beliefs. So where we're finding some hope here is that we have at least the sort of awareness of the fact of, our, the, of the um, kinds of experiences we're having or the content of our experiences, and we can be aware of our beliefs and so on. So far, so good, maybe not, but that's, that's where we're at. And, and so really, I think what I've said so far is not very controversial. That is to say, I think most people, most epistemologists would say, yeah, so far so good, that's fine. But it's what we say next that it gets interesting, that it gets controversial, and you have a bunch of different views that weigh in uh, for what it is to have knowledge of, say, this desk or that tree or that you're another, uh, that you're a mind, right? Um, and that you're not just a figment of my imagination or my experience. Right. These are the things that we, again, if you think of Bonjour, how he started the chapter, or started the book, actually, is identifying all these things that we take ourselves to know. Certainly those would be amongst uh, those claims. And so that's where, that's where we want to get to. There's a bunch of different ways we're going to, you know, people will see as getting there. All right. Any questions about any of that? Everybody feeling all right there? Christian? No. As far as I'm aware, he's not. And I, and I had one of my professors was, was his, one, of, one of his PhD students. And so, not that he was a Christian either, but yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure not. I was trying to think of something that's true of the actual tree that's not true of the experience. Yeah. It has spatial extension, but your experience of it doesn't. But... I guess you wouldn't have any way of knowing or getting through yeah. 
Okay. Well, you, you've got a kind of spatial extension in your experience. In other words, we can, we can, and we can be tricked into it as, you know, all those 3D pictures or, you know, to draw the box or whatever. You know, we can kind of give dimension to things. That's not very good, is it? But, um, <laughs> however, like we do have depth, we, we can, you know, um, even though we can sort of be tricked into, you know, what looks like depth. So it, it's right to say this problem, this doesn't have extension in the physical sense of extension. Um, but do we have access to that extension? I think is the point you're, you're. So even if you had multiple individual viewing <laughs> things, they could all be just, um, sort of given their experiences by some that or even they could be figments of your evil demon experience so that evil demon is like just like you all of you guys you may not be here how can I know right how do I know that I'm not dreaming or being deceived or in the matrix or whatever um, this, this whole philosophy or section of it that we're talking about what if the tree is not really there how do we know what properties the tree really has is there this is all from a Cartesian standpoint and you're about to in another section of the class give us another way of looking at it. well this is sort of a Cartesian ex approach um, I think Bonjour says something like that that this this is kind of falling in that tradition but I would say is it really Cartesian as much as and I guess where I'm I'm trying to start is what seems very very plausible. Yeah. It, so I'm not going to. The rest of my question is uh -huh. this Cartesian. So okay. Is, is I mean obviously you believe the Bible. Right. You don't believe that the Bible is a figment of your imagination. You're presenting <laughs> kind of True. some basics to us, but this isn't the way things are, obviously. Well, I'm just saying so far. So like we've kind of we've gotten I'm so I, what I, I'm what I'm not saying is we should be skeptics about the external world certainly I'm just saying that's the worry if all we get epistemologically are the contents of our own mind you know and and so on um, so yeah, no, I'm I'm headed to saying yes, we do have knowledge of trees. I do have knowledge of your the your existing mind um, as as distinct from my own. Um, yeah, because if if I mean it's if this is true, it's certainly out of step with Christianity. Um, there are, there are versions of skepticism. Let's just, let's just go with that. This is out of step with Christianity. I think it's very, very difficult to be, yeah, that would, that would sort of like, so you're but. Just describing different philosophical theories. Yeah, and I, I'm just starting with what I think is very non-controversial of what we seem to clearly know, and then saying, but here's the worry. Here's, here's what drives a lot of contemporary epistemology is trying to get past the veil. And then there's going to be a, a, a variety of ways people do it or, or attempt it. Um, With the Barclay and <laughs> that's what I was kind of uh, had in mind because in some ways the Barclay and I mean they wouldn't like this at all um, is conceding there is no I mean there is a kind of external world but the external world is very different from what we think right so they're going to say something like. God's just giving us these experiences, and that's all there is to the external world is our, our perceptions, right? Because Do that's... Do plans to be determinists? Then? No. It's interesting because if I'm not really doing anything, but God's just giving me these experiences, he could be giving me the experience of sinning or being righteous or whatever, or going to hell, when in actuality you're just a brain. Yeah, except for that you're not even a brain for the Barclay and right? Because the brain is physical. Um, but no, they would say, so, and I maybe didn't say this clearly enough a second ago, 
they would say to be is to be perceived or to be a perceiver. So they've got they've got the mind and ideas. So because you and that's it. Me, no, so you are in virtue of the fact that you're mind. But to perceive this podium in a way makes it the case that it is. The perceiving of it. So we walk out of here, no more podium. So the passive voice is referring to inanimate objects. Yeah, I think so. Um, what I was going to say is that they, Barclay himself, as I, as I recall, is very careful to say that the mind makes choices and has freedom, sins, um, but God is doesn't need physical objects. He can just sort of zap us with the experiences and so on. So you're like a soul only. You are a soul only, no body. All you have is experiences of a body. Um, That's the ascetic, isn't it? Well, it's, it's uh, a, I want to say a very different picture. <laughs> I mean, that seems obvious enough, right? That... Um, then what we assume to be the case, the Barclayan works hard to say it's not that different because, because in, in part this very reason is that it looks like our access are just through what Barclay would call the ideas, through perceptions and our beliefs and so on, that if everything as far as my relation to this podium is experiential, I can touch it, see it, if I wanted to taste it, I don't want to, but, um, right, then in what sense is there a podium, Barclay would say, beyond just the ideas of the podium? So it's it's an interesting, I, I love Barclay, I love reading it because it's so very interesting, I think it's nuts, but. Uh, <laughs> the tree in the forest that falls does not make a sound because there is no, yeah, there's no tree, no forest right, not there. yeah. If it's not being perceived. Now, the only caveat, and then we're, we're going to move on because this isn't, we're going to talk about Descartes. Um, we will get, Barclay will come back for us. Um, the only caveat is, is some Barclayans would say, ah, but you're forgetting a perceiver. And that would be God. So God, but the worry about this is that, of course, you know, one, is God a really a perceiver? I'm not sure we want to say God has perception. He, he certainly doesn't have, like, sense faculties in the way that we have sense faculties, at least on my view. Maybe Barclay's view, he can make sense of it. Um, right, we, we use our eyes and our ears and things, and, and God doesn't have those. Um, and I'm a little concerned about God having perceptions, because I, th I think that's a bad... It's, I, I think of this as a bad theological view where we have God just sort of like up in heaven, sort of looking down, watching, <laughs> you know, what's going on. It just seems to be so very anthropomorphic and, uh, in a way, degrading of God. And so God's knowledge, now this is an interesting topic because it's a whole other thing of epistemology is to talk about what God's knowledge is. Um I think God's knowledge is conceptual and not perceptual. God knows in virtue of his omniscience all truths. He doesn't have to sort of like, you know, pop in popcorn or something, watch the, how everything unfolds. Uh, yeah, it's a joke, sorry. Um, right, he just knows in virtue of his omniscience. So it's more like how we know a priori truths like 2 plus 3 equals 5 and so on. But he would know what you're having for dinner tonight, conceptually, in an a priori sort of way. I think he does say that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I probably stole it from him. I think a lot of people do say that. I think that's the way we should go. And I don't even know if Barclayans would say God knows perceptually, um, but the way they describe it sure sounds like God does, and that seems to be a problem. Okay, Descartes. Um, so getting into Descartes a bit here. Um, okay, how, how, what, are, what, what, are, what are these things? What are we reading here? What are the meditations, right? I think the right way to think of the meditations, so, it's, so this is not a journal 
that Descartes using to sort of record his experiences. Um, right. Um, he is recommending that we, in a way, go through this meditative process. But even that, I'm not sure he really expected us to, you know, have this concentrated time where we doubt everything that we can doubt, think about the dream argument, think about the evil demon, and so on. I think the way to think of this is like this sustained, you know, really long thought experiment where he is, I mean, it's interesting because not too many people write this way um, in the history of philosophy because he did record, he did write, you know, treat, uh, treatise, um, uh, his discourse and, and other things, but he tried to make this, they're, they're relatively short. So I think that whole document that I sent you, which has far more than just the six meditations, is like 50 pages. So it's not very long. Um, and he's trying to sort of walk you through it. So it's, imagine I'm saying this. Imagine, right, I've just had you do a thought experiment of what he's doing and having you do a thought experiment. But anyway, um, so imagine he's doing that. He's saying, imagine you're going to meditate on these things and try to doubt everything you're going to you could possibly doubt, right? And then if you can doubt it, then you jettison that belief. And in a way, we're going to doubt everything and kind of see what's left over as a result of it. So again, this is called meth his methodological doubt or his method of doubt. Um, uh, and so in a way, he's walking you through what you kind of would think if you were doing this, even though I don't think he's expecting you to. Okay, uh, so what he's going to right away notice is that there's a lot of things that we have been wrong about. There's a lot of things in which we thought were true, it turns out to not be true. So he does make a, oh, this is that book I mentioned too, by the way. Um, it's a three-volume set. Uh, it's got all of Descartes' writings in it. If you're for Descartes' interest, this is, I, I really I enjoy this um, translation too. But this is his meditations and then all the um, letters and replies that he has. So it's the it's sometimes called the CSM version, and that's just the three editors, Cottingham, Stutthof, and Murdoch. I know Co Cottingham's a big, big figure in, in these things, but um, it's three volumes, yeah. So the first one is his other writings. So it's all the writings of Descartes. It's everything we have of Descartes, as I understand it. Cambridge University Press. First volume, I think, is like his early stuff and, and other writings. This is completely the meditations and all the letters and replies. And then it's all of his correspondence. That's why I say it's really interesting because it's like him and Tom Thomas Hobbes like going back and forth. And it'd be, it'd be like what it is today on like a blog. Or like a Facebook post or something where like these guys go back and forth. Um, I'm sure they had to like send letters and they go by. And, I was going to say carrier pigeon, but I, I'm sure they had better methods than that. Horses and things, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. It's like they write this letter, send it off, have to wait. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, okay. So... Uh, he's going to start out doubting everything he can possibly doubt. He, he's he's thinking about the facts that that he is often wrong about some things. Um, okay. He's going to give two, at least two arguments, it seems, um, to motivate this. The first is the dream argument, and this is to imagine that we are, imagine that you are right now, still in bed, <laughs> asleep. Um, Having this very vivid dream, again, I don't, I'm never sure if we should call that a nightmare, if it's, you know, philosophy class or whatever, but um, in any case, you're in bed dreaming, um, right? Isn't it, isn't it possible, he's asking, again, he's not asserting that you are in fact dreaming. It's not a claim he's making. He's just saying, imagine that were to be the case. Wouldn't your experience be just like this? What do you think? Everybody on board with the dream argument? Why not? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. Now, so that's that's often the reaction this sort of argument elicits is that, uh, look, my dreams aren't like that. 
But notice the problem there to say that. What's your, what you are assuming, it seems, is what it's like to dream and what it's like to not dream and saying, my experience right now is not like what it is to dream, therefore I must not be dreaming. But notice that's the very thing that's at issue is what if you are dreaming, right? What if all of your life has been this massive dream um, all of your weight, you know, sort of like what you take to be waking experiences have actually been dream experiences, and you've not woken up yet. I think so, right? So you're you um, to assume you know what dreams are like, vis-a-vis -vis non dreams or like actual experiences is what he's questioning. How do you know the difference? <laughs> right. So. Now, he's going to back off on it because I think maybe he knows a lot of people, right? Because I, I often have students say, well, look, my dreams are usually pretty chaotic, and I usually don't have people confess too much about their dreams, but, um, right, there's, there's crazy stuff going on. It doesn't always make sense, whereas this is very systematic, and it's very sort of normal um, or whatever. And so, but again, that seems to be assuming you already know what a dream is like. And I'm not sure we get that if we're truly trying to imagine the possibilities here. Isn't it merely, isn't it um, possible? And that's one thing I, I wanted to revisit just a little bit is what do we mean when we say it's possible? Because there's a lot of different senses of this term possibility and philosophers will, will talk about different notions of possibility. I think here all we mean is something like logical possibility or that it's logically possible. And for logical possibility, what we typically mean is that it's conceivable. Something is logically possible insofar as it's conceivable. Now, that really throws wide <laughs> what is and what isn't logically possible. Because if it's merely conceivable, again, an important question to ask is, well, what's conceivable, right? Because this is, I'm throwing terms out there, so I'm not assuming you, you have a better grasp on conceivable than logically possible. But it's kind of like what's imaginable. Can you imagine some set of, of facts as being the case? If so, it's logically possible in this sense, because presumably what we're doing there is we're conceiving of it being that way. So can I conceive of you guys sitting in different chairs, maybe one chair to the left today? Yeah, no prop, like that's easy, right? Easy to do. I can conceive of you uh, wearing different shirts today. Um, I can conceive of us being in a different room for this class. I can conceive of this building not having been built. All of these things are easy to conceive of. I can imagine them being the case. Again, therefore, it seems these are all logically possible states of affairs. Okay, let's get a little more uh, crazy. <laughs> let's get a little crazy here. Um, I can also imagine you leaving class today, really kind of wanting to avoid traffic, so you fly like Superman home from class. Now, what you want to notice is that is conceivable. I can imagine that happening, but it's not physically possible, we might say. Um, yeah, physically possible. So on that one, it's logically possible, but not physically possible. Right, that you fly like Superman home today. That's, that's not part of, you know, physics would not allow that in a certain sense. Um, is it logically possible that the earth explodes? Yes. Easy to imagine. It, I say this sometimes. Some of you maybe heard me say this. If they can make a movie about it, chances are it's logically possible, right? Because you're kind of seeing it on screen. Now, um, there's some times in which the movie is fudging on what's really coherent and things like that. Probably the Matrix is incoherent in the sense that Neo is communicating with other people in the Matrix, 
right? Because if that's going on in his head, it's not clear how you have communication like in the matrix. And so even though we're watching that in the movie, you kind of start thinking about it. It's like, mm, uh, I don't know. Uh, I think, what's the um, uh, movie about the dreams? Um, yeah, Inception. That's also, you know, philosophically interesting in a sense. But the, I, as I recall, they're able to like talk with each other in, in somebody's dream. It's not clear <laughs> what that would even amount to philosophically. So I, but, I was about to ask, okay, what about, you know, non-contradiction? Like, I can imagine a contradiction, obviously, but I don't know what it would actually Well, see, that's, that's, that's a good point. That's a great way uh, to bring this issue up. The question is, can you really do that? Now, here's what I, here's what I definitely can do. I can imagine a word, right? put together with something that says not that term. So I can, or a, or a claim with the, the negation of that claim, the words I can imagine. But when you start to think about, uh, we're not talking about the language, we're talking about the actual states of affairs. Could you imagine God existing and not existing in the same time in the same sense? I can imagine in different senses, of course, I can, because we all think that. We think the God of the Bible exists. We don't think the God of the Quran exists. But those are two different senses of the term God. Um, but in the same time, in the same sense, and again, we can think of something like, um, I can imagine, uh, I was going to say my grandfather who's passed away. Not, I mean, he still exists, though. So uh, physically existing and not existing. But those are at two different times. You see what I mean? But when we say same time, same, same sense, I'm not sure we can conceive of... I, I, let me say it a little stronger. We cannot, it seems to me, conceive of A and not A in the same time in the same sense. You see what I'm saying? So you can conceive of the language, no problem. I can... Do it on a movie, I can do it on the board. Um, um, a and not A. Boom. But how could I believe, how could I cons put content to the A, put a proposition in there, namely God exists or Patriots win? <laughs> I don't know, you know, I don't care uh, about the Super Bowl so much, but um, right. I couldn't imagine that at the same time in the same sense. It's not logically possible. Okay. Um, walking on water, easy. And if you're Jesus, here, too. Um, right. Uh, so it's like the Green Lantern. If I can come up with it in my mind, I can do it. Is that the Green Lantern? Yeah. I guess I don't know the Green Lantern. Really, that makes him very powerful. It seems to me. Um, yes, that would be right. Uh, though, except for the making it real, <laughs> right? Uh, we make it as a logical possibility. Now, oftentimes philosophers will say it this way: they'll say uh, there exists a possible world in which I can fly like Superman. And people say. Oh, really? Well, yeah, I just mean a possible world. I don't mean the actual world. The actual world is very different from that. Fortunately, it would be nice. If it, yeah. Uh, but that's we use possible world talk to just identify, really, logically possible states of affairs. So going with the Superman analogy, like if I'm dreaming in like my sleep dream, and I dream that I can fly, yet I'm dreaming that I'm just dreaming. <laughs> you know, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, uh, corporately dreaming so in the dream, you're I dreaming that you can fly? Yeah. Like, or like in the dream, sleep, you can fly? Like my, dreams, my sleep dream, I can fly. But my, you know, this dream that well, this is just all just kind of whatever. Yeah. And not really just like this isn't really here. Uh -huh. That dream, I can't. It's physically not possible. Um, okay, so the question is, if I'm dreaming, but it's a dream within a dream, right? Essentially. Yeah. Like if I'm asleep dreaming, yeah. I can fly in my sleep dream, but my 
or this is all just a dream, I can't physically do it. Okay, so typically when we're talking about physical possibility, we mean in the actual world, whatever that may be. That's a good question. So in a poss would, would we say, I know this isn't exactly how you put it, but this is, I think, part of what you're saying, is in a possible world, are there actual physical possibilities kind of indexed to that world? So now you're, you're imagining it where it's a dream world within a dream. Because I can actually fly in my sleep dream. Yeah. With, which is within the dream world. I guess. Why do we need the dream world, though? Because he's saying, what if, like, what if this all this is, is a dream? This, yeah. This reality is actually yeah. a dream in which I cannot fly. But within this dream, I go to sleep at night, and I dream that I can fly. Okay. Okay. I see. Yeah. So typically what we mean by physical possibility is as it relates to the actual world, right? So we're sort of putting epistemology aside for a minute, assuming we know what the actual world is and is like. So we're, we're maybe running it together too many um, worries, <laughs> right? So when somebody does metaphysics, in a lot of ways, they need to assume answers to these skeptical worries and things like that. So we're kind of doing metaphysics here. We're saying, tell me about the nature of possibility. And I want to say there's at least two different ways. There's more than that. Metaphysical possibility is something people talk a lot about um, that we won't get bogged down in that right now. I think this is the easiest distinction of possibilities. One is merely conceivable, this turns on the physical world, kind of what what the laws of physics allow and so on. What sorts of powers as a physical being now do I have? Um, that's why I say Jesus can walk on the water because he had that power, had that ability uh, in virtue of his um, divinity and so on. Whereas we don't, so in a way, what we're assuming here is in the actual world, which we're assuming is a physical world, which we're assuming has all these things in it and certain powers and so on, what's possible in that world. So you, can, you could make sense of a possible world or a dream world and say, what's physically possible there? But now you've got something like what's, what's logically, um, what's... I'm going to say logically, physically possible. Um, what's logically possible, or what's physically possible in this logically possible world? And I think, yeah, I think we're kind of blending a few. Okay, but does that make sense? So now here's the here's how this relates to Descartes. Um, this right. Let me say one more. Let me get one more concept before us. Um, and that's the logically impossible, right? That would be contradictions and so on. Um, sorry, there's lot, so there's going to be logically possible. There's going to be logically impossible. Let's do this. Impossible. And then the logically necessary. Um, something that's logically necessary means that it can't be false, right? It's true in all possible worlds. Yeah, so that's the way philosophers talk about it is being true in all possible worlds. Um, what are examples of this? Well, logical truths would be thought to be um, logically necessary. They can't be false. Um, we could state the law of non-contradiction this way. It's not the case that A and not A in the same time, same sense. 
that's logically necessary. That's a logically necessary truth. There's no possible world in which contradictions exist. This is the negation of that, right? But that, that statement is logically necessary, or, or what we sometimes say is necessarily true. Um, this seems to be logically necessary that... Um, well, let me, this, what I'm first going to say is not necessarily, but, uh, if P then Q, P, uh, here's how I'll say it. <laughs> Given these premises, it's logically necessary, I'll just do LN, that Q. That's log that follows in this logically necessary way that if P then Q is the case and P is the case, then it just follows from that that Q is the case. You couldn't conceive of a world in which one and two are true and uh, Q is false. So Sorry. Modus bonds. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to illustrate um, that logical truths are necessary truths. Is this the law of chromatic? Law of ca causality. Yeah, because something here, uh, because of the laws of causality, so next it must follow. Um, I don't think I would call this. So the question was, is this the law of causality? I don't think I would call this the law of causality here. I, um, I what I guess I'm trying to illustrate is the relation between these two premises and this conclusion. Um. So we would say something like, uh, th therefore, so the three dots, there's therefore Q. And what I'm saying is that there's a <clears throat> relation between these two, a logical relation uh, that's logically necessary in our, our sense that we've defined here. It can't not be true that if these premises are true, that conclusion follows. I don't think it's causation, though. But if, uh, but, uh, if premise one says, if P, then Q. Uh -huh. But if there is no law of chirality, so if we give you, give you uh, any P, it doesn't mean that it always follows this Q. That's right. So I think it's also confirmed on the false. It, it, are you saying that this is a form of the law of causality? Yeah. Okay. That might be the case. And people, um, it's definitely true that not for every P, there's a Q that, you know, is implied by it. And this is not actually saying that. This is only saying that if that is the case, that P implies Q, and if it's the case that P, and it follows from that in this logically necessary way. In other words, there's no possible world that one, I think I said this a minute ago, I'll just repeat it, uh, that one and two are true and Q is, and sorry, and three is false. All right, this logic, it's logically necessary. Somebody else? Yeah, Paul. So these things are foundational to Descartes' meditation. Was like his assumption is that, like the original faith, that logical mm -hmm. axioms are true. Oh, sorry, was that the question? Um, yeah. uh, he's not, so he's doing the thought experiment, and we are doing the interpretation of Descartes, right? Because it's not completely obvious always what he's got, sort of like operative in the claims that he makes, like how he's going from piece to piece to piece to piece. And so, yeah, what I'm saying is it looks like what he's doing is he's looking for something that's logically necessary. Um, because if it's, if it's logically possible, it's always going to be dubitable. There's always going to be some thought experiment or other as, and again, the reason why it can get fanciful like an evil demon even in matrix, you know, et cetera, et cetera, is because all we're talking about is logical possibility. So if it's if it's logically possible that it's false, uh, then it's dubitable for Descartes. 
Now, this is going to be almost everything. That's what I, that's the point I'm, I have all this sort of elaborate setup to say is that's almost every one of our beliefs is going to be logically possible that it's false. That you have hands, is it, is it, is there, is it possible, just merely conceivable that you are a, some sort of brain in a vat, so take away your body here, uh, that you're having experiences caused by a matrix or caused by an evil demon or caused by a mad scientist that's stimulating. Yeah, that seems possible, right? I know what you're talking about. Uh, when you talk about contradiction, I have no idea what we're saying about that. I can't even conceive of that. Uh, a square circle, I can't even like try to get that before my mind. I, I can't do it. I can't even imagine what you're making reference to. It sounds like nonsense because it is, right? I can take a, I can take a square in my mind, sort of imagine a square, and start to round out the uh, All of a sudden, it's no longer a square. <laughs> I can't make it a square circle. Um, these are all logically impossible, but can I imagine myself being a mind that's floating in, floating in immaterial space that's handless? Yeah. Or a brain in a vat that's handless? Yeah. So even the fact that I have hands, that I have a physical body, that you exist, that the tables are here, that the buildings here, the trees are there, all of that, it's logically possible that it's false. Therefore, it's dubitable. Therefore, it's jettisoned for Descartes in his project. Okay. Now, um, he's going to land on, um, of course, the cogit, what's called the cogito. Um, this is that he exists. I think, therefore, I am is one statement of it in the letters and replies. I think it is uh, in the in the um, text here. Maybe it's worth reading this here. Um, he has it as, I am, I exist. Yeah, which is not quite the same if you think about it. I think, therefore, I am. Um, but let me, uh, let me read this here. So... This kind of midway th through the, f I think it's the fourth paragraph. But I've just said that I have no senses and no body. This is the sticking point. What follows from this? Am I not so bound up with a body and with senses that I cannot exist without them? But I've convinced myself that there's absolutely nothing in the world, no sky, no earth, no minds, no bodies. Does it now follow that I too do not exist? And he says sort of decidedly no. If I'm convinced, if I've convinced myself of something, then I certainly exist. Then I certainly exist it. But there is a deceiver of supreme power and cunning who is deliberately and constantly deceiving me. In that case, I too undoubtedly exist. If he is deceiving me and let him deceive me as much as he can, he will never bring it about that I am nothing so long as I think that I am something. So after considering everything very thoroughly, I must finally conclude that this that this proposition, I am, I exist, is necessarily true whenever it is put forward by me or, my, or conceived in my mind. Okay, so um, he lands on that fact and sort of at this point in the meditation, that fact alone. Now what this does seem to bring up... Um, Because in, in some of this we read, but the rest of the meditations he, he kind of, he goes certainly much further is he, what he's landed on is a kind of foundational truth from which he's going to build back now the rest of the structure, so to speak, of his knowledge, right? Because here's the thing. Again, this way I think people sometimes get wrong when they first encounter Descartes. He's not a skeptic. He actually thinks we have knowledge of everything that we sort of take ourselves to know. Uh, he might be a little uh, more judicious than others. You know, as a philosopher, he might be saying, well, do we really have knowledge of X? You know, maybe not. 
But for the most part, all the things that Bonjour listed in his beginning part are things that Descartes would agree we have knowledge of. What he's doing, though, he's trying to do the epistemology. He's trying to say, well, what does that look like? How do we define our knowledge? How do we sort of structure it or build the case, um, uh, sort of like paint the picture of it, so to speak? And so the, what, the tradition that sort of comes out of Descartes' philosophy and especially his epistemology is what's referred to as foundationalism. And that's not to say everyone is a foundationalist these days, foundationalism, but it's definitely, I would say, the dominant view. Sometimes it gets a bad rap, <laughs> but usually because people have a particular version of foundationalism in mind. As a just mere thesis of foundationalism, it's a fairly minimalist, very plausible view, though again, not everybody holds to it. And we'll, we'll spend uh, some, some degree of time talking about this. Uh, I'll mention this more later, but, but Bonjour starts his philosophical career rejecting foundationalism. But quite, I think, you know, to his credit, um, reversed course and is now a foundation. And I say to his credit just because it takes quite the courage to, uh, um, I mean, he, he literally wrote books on these alternative views. And uh, it was funny because in my, I think it was my, it must have been my comprehensive exams uh, during my PhD, I wanted to look at the view that, you know, denies this, and I asked my advisor, like, what's the best book that you'd recommend? And he said, Bonjour's, <laughs> Bonjour's book, even though he repudiates it. Um, that's still the best book defending this other sort of view. Okay, let me define foundationalism, then I'll just mention what the other view is. It's this kind of idea that um, there's a lot of things that we claim to know but we know those things on the basis of other beliefs, right? But what we'll notice when we ha whenever there's a belief in the mix, we need to have reasons to think that the belief is true. And so that belief is going to, we have to say, well, what, what reasons do we have to believe that's true? And if it's another belief, well, we're going to have to have reasons for that belief too, right? And so the worry is, if we don't ever land on something that's foundational, then it doesn't see, you know, we have, we've got this worry of an infinite regress. Let me say that again. I don't know if that came out super clearly. A belief is, a belief is such that it may or may not be true, right? We all have beliefs. Hopefully most of them are true, right? But we all have false beliefs. So, you know, who knows, who knows what, but maybe I believe, um, eagles are going to, you know, pull it out this, this, uh, pull it off this Sunday. Um, that may be false. Okay. Let's just be honest. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, or I might believe that, um, I'm healthy when I'm not right. There might be something going on that I just don't know about. Um, there's a host of things that, that, in other words, the belief doesn't guarantee truth. Beliefs are either true or false. We hope they're true. What, what do we need? We need justification or evidence or reason, something to show that that belief is true. Oftentimes, it's another belief. I erased it, but like that modus ponens, arguments, there's premises that give me reason to conclude, uh, to, ha to believe the conclusion. But how do I know the premises are true? Right? I'm going to have to argue for those. I'm going to have to have premises for the premises. But how do I know those premises are true? I'm going to have to have argu an argument for that. I'm going to have to have premises for the premises for the premises. And the, the I just messed it up. Um, right? The concern is if that goes on infinitely, we call it an infinite regress, and we're going to talk a lot about that. So. Uh, if this doesn't all click for you, just know we're coming back to it. Um, then we don't have any knowledge whatsoever. We don't have, we don't believe anything rationality, rash, um, we don't believe anything rationally because we don't ever hit on something that is 
is either you know rational in itself or uh, produ in a way produces rationality without itself needing to be rationalized or believe rationally. <laughs> okay, uh, it's this sort of picture. We need these foundational beliefs, and it might not be the case, and these are beliefs, I don't know why I'm doing blocks, but anyway, I guess it's the foundation idea. All right, from these beliefs we can infer other beliefs, and so on and so forth, right? And build the sort of edifice of knowledge or rational justification, rationally justified beliefs. But if there's not a bottom to this, right, then it just regresses infinitely. So there's got to be some sort of beliefs that end this process. Um, of inference, what, what we might call the process of inference. Now, one of the things Descartes is saying, it seems, or this is how people, a lot of people take him, is be saying that what marks out the foundation, right? What about what about I am I exist? Was special about that belief? You you guys tell me. It was yeah, it was certainty, right? He held that with certainty. Um, it couldn't. It wasn't possible to doubt its truth, right? It was held certain it, with certainty. Um, some people would say, if you have certainty at this level, then that's the foundation, sort of proper foundation from which you can infer everything else that you believe. Okay. What's, what would you say is the concern about that? <laughs> or what, what might bother you a little bit about requiring that? Uh, if the thing that's on a certain amount of circuit? It's circular. Could be, right? Because um, though we might say if it's circular, it can't be certain, perhaps. I mean, maybe those go hand in hand. So, the, so what Paul said was that um, the, the concern would be that if something is, it could be certain and circular still. Um, now we don't remember we don't mean by certainty just like super really confident. <laughs> we don't mean that's not our notion of certainty. What we mean is there's a there's logical necessity to that belief. Another word would be that there's just not enough. Yeah, right. There's just not a broad enough foundation to sort of build back everything that we know in doing the epistemology. I mean, especially if all we've got is I am, I exist, what can you infer from that? Well, he does. He makes an inference. Anybody remember what, what that inference is? Is that the next step where he goes, if I'm perceiving it, then it's true that I'm perceiving it? Not quite. He, does, he will get there. But there's something that he sort of immediately, at least I think I don't have the order wrong here. Not just that he exists, but he's a thinking thing. Yeah, that he's a thinking thing. <laughs> so not much. He's not gotten far. Uh, he's from the fact that I am, I exist, he gets that he's a thinking thing. He doesn't know that he's a body. He doesn't know that he has any physical part to him. In a way, what we might say is he knows he's a soul, and that's it. And, and that will be Descartes' view, by the way, is that, um, at least typically this is, this is referenced back to Descartes, is the body-soul composite. That we are, we are most fundamentally souls that have bodies, though the body is somewhat incidental to us. We're seeing here, now you might have like theological reasons for believing that, you might have a, 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 you know, other reasons. For him, he's giving philosophical reasons. Uh, really epistemological reasons. He's saying, look, if I know anything, I know that I'm a soul slash thinking thing, you know, or mind or something. You know, all those terms sort of become synonymous uh, in this discussion. He thinks he will go on to say that, you know, we can justify believing that we're bodies, but that, that's going to come later on. Did you? Uh, yeah, so, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe presuppositionalists 
reject the Perdico? They reject a lot. Um, no, I'm kidding. They, they reject philosophy, so yeah, probably reject the Perdico. I think kind of what you were saying, the concern is that we don't have enough of a base left yeah. to reconstruct all of our knowledge. Would that be maybe a reason that, that they reject the Cogito because they say that we can't know all these different things, we can't make sense of reality with just this one base, we have to have a wider base, and that includes the Bible. Yeah, I, I don't think for the presuppositionalists. I think the presuppositionalist just says we can't know that from... We're not getting the cogito from Scripture, so therefore it's out. Yeah, it, it seems they also say that basically you get down to core beliefs, foundational beliefs, that can't be proven. Therefore, the only way to tell whether you have a rational worldview is to see if you can explain what else is around you from that. And if you can't, that's how you know that it's wrong. That's the only way it's to go mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they're doing a similar kind of a thing, though on the foundational layer they would just say, this is certain versions of um, presuppositionalism. Some wouldn't even like, they would, you know, already this is our, it's too philosophical or whatever. But uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Gordon Clark wants to say what, we're, what we need to kind of take as foundational or what's sometimes called properly basic is just the claims of Scripture. And then whatever we can infer from there, that's fine, right? But, and you can't question these. These we just take as axioms because they are um, the divine, divinely revealed truths or something like that. But let's not um, get too far into that because that'll get us... Uh, far afield, <laughs> I think, pretty quick. Uh, is, yes, Leo. Uh, his certainty of knowledge is really foundation, or his certainty of knowledge already built on the logical foundation. Mm. Say that one more time. So, his certainty of of knowledge, uh, of his exists. Yeah, certainty of his existence. Is, is really the foundation, or is it, his um, certainty of his existence already built on the logic of our world. Logic of what? Like, like you just said, logic of logic, uh, logic of non contradiction. Oh, uh, um, is it built on the, the of, built of the laws of logic? Logically, I think there are some more at, at, at the, under the. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's assuming logic. He's assuming so, the question is sort of like. And you also assume there is a deceiver to deceive. Yeah. Them. Well, he, he, again, he's not assuming that there is. He's assuming that what if there is. Like he's sort of saying, you know, imagine this possibility. Uh, you're right that this is probably even Descartes would say that's really. I mean, yeah, it's sort of my view, but that's a pretty simplistic rendering of my view. Descartes would say he's got other things, but I think. Again, if this is a kind of thought experiment that's meant to sort of like, we're supposed to like zero in on I am, I exist, and realize, boy, yeah, there's there's a quality there to that belief that most of my other beliefs, maybe all of my other beliefs, don't seem to have, and that's that certainty. So he's sort of, you know, cleared away the confusions and the doubts, and we've done as he wants us to zero in on that for at least a minute in the meditations. But you're right. I think that he's make he's he also seems to have a grasp of like logical truths. Now, whether or not that's down below or that those are also these certain beliefs he has, coupled with this belief, perhaps he can infer other things. I'm not sure. You know, maybe the sort of illustration will break down a little bit. But nonetheless, those would also be things that he. He knows with certainty, I think, these logical truths. And he will. He will expand the base. Somebody mentioned it, that he'll expand the base to include um, the contents um, of his mental states, states, even though he doesn't use that terminology. Um, let's see if I can grab that real quick. So this is... Um, anyway... You don't have the same page number, so never mind. 
Uh, this is towards the end of the second meditation. He'll say, um, for even if I, as I've supposed, none of the objects of imagination are real, the power of imagination is something which really exists and is part of my thinking. Lastly, it is also the same I who has sensory perceptions or is aware of <clears throat> bodily things, as it were, through the senses. For example, I am now seeing light, hearing a noise, feeling heat, but I am asleep, so all this is false. Yet, I certainly seem, and seemings is going to be something we'll talk a lot about, the seemings of, of things, yet I certainly seem to see, to hear, and to be warmed. This, he says, cannot be false. What is called having a sensory perception is strictly just this, uh, and in this restricted sense of the term, it is simply thinking. Right? So what, what he's saying there is the sort of contents of these things, that it seems to him there's a fire there, or, see, or maybe even seems to him that he's being warmed. Right? That, he, that cannot be false. That's something he enjoys certainty. So we might expand this base out uh, uh, really actually probably considerably more if we think about how many beliefs that would be, beliefs about our own experiences and things. Um, right. Now, a lot of people read Descartes and they say Descartes did a terrific job at clearing away those things that are dubitable. <laughs> right? Great job with that. The building it all back, not so good. Um, he's going to, uh, as Bonjour mentions, uh, you didn't read it in the meditations that you read necessarily, um, he's going to have God play a major epistemological role for him, which I like, by the way. Um, so he's going to say that, he, anyway, he's going to give a kind of ontological argument for God's existence, thinks that that's going to be added into this base, that coupled with his sense experiences and that God's not a deceiver, he thinks he now has reason to believe, in a way, I've, I've gone way too quickly, but it's something to that effect, he's got reasons to believe, he knows the objects of his sense experiences, because God couldn't deceive him in that, given that it's God. <laughs> right? um, at least not systematically deceive him. We couldn't all be deceived. I think Descartes would say about Barclay's idea Right, that God is de that would be God deceiving us if these things aren't real. And again, Barclay thinks they are real in a sense. But he would say to the skeptic, because of now, almost everybody, even many many theists, thinks that his argument for God is a bad one. <laughs> right, so that again, he did a bang up job getting us to here where we've rejected everything we know except for I am, I exist, maybe the contents of our own mind, but a terrible job of building it all back. So what he's handed in a way to the world is skepticism about the external world, right? Now, so what you do whenever you have these sort of philosophical um, um, problems, right, is, is to back up and see what led us there. <laughs> and what I would argue is this was part of the problem, is requiring certainty for their foundational beliefs is part of the problem. Now, I'm, a, I'm an avowed foundationalist, um, but I'm going to have a very different um, criterion for what counts as being in the base. Here's minimally what we need to say, and we'll call it a day here, is that it can't be other further beliefs, right? But there's a lot of beliefs that we have that don't seem to be based on further beliefs. If I stub my toe and I'm in like really bad pain, let's say, and I believe that I'm in pain, well, that belief is based directly on the experience of pain itself. And the experience of pain doesn't even make sense to say what justifies it. Right, it just is. It, these are just facts. Again, remember, they're facts that are on this side of the veil. They're facts of which we are directly aware. And the hope is that it's going to be those sorts of beliefs, beliefs that are not based on further beliefs, but are directly based on facts, from which we can build the rest of our knowledge, by inference and so on. But that's a big promise that I'll have to come uh, 
and fulfill later. <laughs> and that's really a lot of the course. So, all right. Well, have a good weekend. Um, yeah. Sorry, Paul. I'm just Paul Baker. I'm just seeing that. Yes, that's right. That's the worry. <laughs> we've, we've got only that small basis. Yeah, that's right. Was that a while ago? I'm sorry. <laughs>